Please note that this content is for adults only. Viewer discretion advised. If you haven't yet, hit the subscribe, like and share. Welcome back to another episode of Grizzly True Crime. My name is Gisela Kay, and today we're going to be looking at a very interesting case that should hopefully go to trial, they say, in the summer of this year. So the crime happened in 2020. It's been a long time to wait for this trial, and so let's look at the case so that we can see what happened here and what kind of trial are we expecting. Thank you so, so much all for being here. Let me just say hi. Hello to TD Stables, welcome to all uh, my moderators, to all my patrons, thank you so much for your support. To all the members as well, you, whose names you can see highlighted in the chat, and to all the new subscribers. Okay, so we've got presentation time, we've got documents that I've been digging out for you to look at. Um, so let's get into it, because what a, what a case this is. Alright, so I'm going to do this. And as usual, <laughs> I'm going to make myself a little bit smaller so you could see it nicely. There we go. That should be good. All right. So this is a picture of Doug Renee, which was Doug's second wife and Eva Benefield. So the reason I'm showing this first is because Eva Oh man, she has been so incredibly strong. She has lost both of her parents. We're going to get into that now. Um, she's sharing a story on TikTok, which we'll look at as well. And she started her own um, t-shirt printing company. And it's just amazing to see, you know, how she's doing after such a terrible loss of both her mom and her dad. Like, whoa. So um, just sending her so much love and support from this community. Mac1968, thank you so much for your $1 super chat. All right, so this would be obviously in the picture. Doug, her dad, and Renee, her mom. All right, so now when we look at December 2nd, 2015. On December 2nd, 2015, Renee Benefield, 56, the second wife of Doug Glass Benefield, 54, died at her home in Mount Pleasant, Charleston County, South Carolina. She suffered from an underlying heart condition, and sadly it was her daughter, Eva, who we just saw, right, 15-year-old Eva, who found her. Doug was out of town for work. She said on her TikTok, that was the start of a lot of trauma, which, oh man, that is just so sad. Uh, Mercedes, thank you for being a member for one month already. So Doug told Eva, after this last ride, so it's his second wife, she died from an underlying heart condition. He said to Eva, don't worry, uh, I don't have any plans of remarrying. And then, nine months later, <laughs> he met 24-year-old model and ballerina Ashley Byers at a Republican Party fundraiser. Now, please don't let that trigger all kinds of political conversation okay <laughs> we're talking true crime we focus on that okay because i know these are some triggering words politics i know it can <laughs> get people going so just remain calm and we keep on going uh debbie thank you so much for being a member for five months and sweet tea for being a member for one month so they met at this republican party fundraiser now she was known to rally woman for trump she was also paid apparently by his office $3,000 a month to run the presidential campaign office or something like that. And we're going to get more into that, but that's where they met, right? Then after just 13 days, 13 days, the pair got married. They shared political views, a belief in God, and they were saying, I love you after just a few dates. Doug told his daughter, Eva, that he wanted Ashley to be a mother figure for her, but Eva did not think that she needed one. And Eva was 15 at the time. She also had two half-brothers. And they commented, Damn, we're older than her. Because Ashley was 24. So Doug's... Um, I actually don't know if those are his stepchildren or his children. Renee, it was Renee and Doug's only child, Eva. So I think, yes, okay, I remember now. Eva saying that the two half-brothers are from her mother's side. But her two half-brothers were older than 
this one, which would be his third wife, right? Like 24 years old. Yeah, I don't know if any 15 year old is going to be like, yep, I'm going to call her mom, right? Unfortunately not. This was one of those whirlwind romances, which is a red flag. Grumpy Granny, thank you so much for your 199 super sticker. So that is very fast. And from everything I'm learning about uh, red flags in relationships, which could lead to domestic abuse, domestic violence, coercive of control, all those red flags we look at in true crime. Yeah, don't dive into a relationship that fast. That would be a red flag I've learned from the courses I'm doing, right? It's like, oh my word, 13 days. Ooh, 13 days they get married. Oh man. So Doug, he has told his daughter that he wanted her to be a mother figure. Eva wasn't, she was like, no, thank you. But Eva says that that initially Ashley was quite nice, but then later uh, she would twist her, her words to, she would twist her words to make her dad get mad at her. So that's not nice either. To play your new hubby against his daughter by saying she said this and this and she did that and that. You know what I mean? That's very immature of Ashley as well. <laughs> yes, hurry to the altar, says Tea Tree's major red flag. It just never ends well. It never ends well. I've been watching the Dirty John series on Netflix and studying that as like a case study for an upcoming course I'm doing. And this also is like, ooh, red flag because diving in so fast, it just comes with so much risk. You don't really know that person and it just has so much expectation and tension attached to it. It's, it's not a good thing. AP, thank you so much for your $1 super sticker. All right, so we've got that backstory. Okay, yes, so they say the, the night that she met Doug for the first time, she had guns on her person, in her purse, in her bra. Stephanie Murphy, Doug's family attorney, says that when Ashley first met Doug, she was working in the Sarasota campaign office of Donald Trump. Her job was to help galvanize the evangelical vote and work the rallies. According to Ashley's journal, she was traveling on Trump's plane when Trump showered her with compliments. As she wrote, he called me a bombshell, his little girl and his baby, which again, red flag. I'm sorry, but no, 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 no. Run for your life. Run for your life. Oh, my word. Okay. Aside from her work in politics, Ashley had also been a fledgling swimsuit model and a dancer with a Maryland youth ballet, where she was sometimes a featured performer. Okay. So we've got that backstory now. Now. Doug was deeply religious and friends say that they think he wanted to marry Ashley before being intimate with her. So that could be why it's like, ooh, 13 days must get married, but still don't, don't do that. <laughs> right. We learn from these cases. We're not victim blaming. We're not victim shaming or anything like that. We just learn from these cases as much as possible. So Trip Cormini, one of Doug's closest friends was actually an ordained Episcopal pastor and agreed to marry the pair. He said he wasn't thrilled because it had only been 13 days since they met, but he agreed to do it. Doug invited almost no one to his wedding, not even Eva, his daughter, who he was extremely close to. And remember, he told her nine months before, don't worry, I'm not going to get married to anyone else. Right? Yes. Yeah, so please do share your thoughts. I mean, Romulan says, I think Doug was dangerous. This case is very interesting. So I would love to hear your thoughts as we go through this. All right. So then Ashley was passionate about ballet, but by the time she was 21, her professional career was over. I suppose that's pretty normal in that, on that career path. I was a swimmer and it was also kind of like that, where you're like, oh, okay, <laughs> when you hit your 20s, that's over. I mean, it doesn't always have to be the case, but it can be, right? It's the norm for it to be. So they say by the time she was 21, her professional career was over. Now, she dreamed of owning her own dance company that would invite dancers from all ethnicities and body types to join. She said there was a problem in the ballet industry. It wasn't inclusive and she wanted to launch this company that would just be so wonderful and inclusive. Doug wanted to make her dreams come true. So together they founded American National Ballet, A-N-B. Dancers from all over the world arrived in Charleston in 2017, excited to join A&B and to live their dreams. Man, I feel sorry for them when you hear what happens next. 
so here is a post that I found from an old Facebook post. It was also on Instagram, American National Ballet. He says it's about six years ago. It says, meet our founder and executive director, Ashley Benefield, a proud Maryland youth ballet graduate and retired professional ballerina. Check out her full bio on the website, hashtag powerful women, American National Ballet, and all of that, right? Thank you, Pernil. This is exactly what I was saying. Please, no political comments. We are for true crime. <laughs> we know it can be triggering these topics, but we're here for true crime. I just needed to give a little bit of backstory so we know what, what are we dealing with, what's happening here. Okay, so this was the post, and uh, she's looking oh so serious about this ballet company. And then what happened? Well, that summer, Ashley fell pregnant. But note that Eva... Doug's daughter, right, said that her dad actually had a vasectomy, but that he had it reversed. When he's, she's like, but you, <laughs> you had your tubes cut, like there was a snip, like how did you get pregnant? He's like, oh, I reversed it. It's just that Ashley didn't think that she would get pregnant so quick. And I'm like, man, I'm just hearing a little bit of manipulation there. I'm not sure about you, but I'm like, oh man, she convinced him, like, get a reversal. So yes, they say Ashley was apparently not expecting to get pregnant that quickly. Well, <laughs> okay. So then Eva says that Ashley had a terrible pregnancy and was sick all of the time. But because Doug was working full time, and remember now he's trying to run the ballet company himself, okay? Um, he could not take care of her full time as well. He was a consultant for technology companies and government contractors. Like, he had a lot on his plate, and she was having a terrible pregnancy, and she needed full-time care, right? According to her. Sharon Grant says, how's the G towards your gel pen fund keep you stocked up? <laughs> Thank you so much, Sharon Grant. I really appreciate it. Yes, I've got them gel pens right here. Thank you so much. I will get more. <laughs> I can never have enough. Huh? So... So are you hearing what I'm saying here? She's like all demanding, needy with the time. I understand a husband needs to be there for you, but like she needed him there 24 seven. He's like, hello, I'm trying to run a ballet company that I just started with you. This is an unexpected surprise that she's now pregnant and he knows nothing about ballet. So it was really hard for him, right? He's trying to run that. He's trying to still do his job full time. So you know what she did? She started filing domestic violence reports against him. It appears that the main, they say, they say in the affidavit, it appears that the main focus of these complaints was to keep the child away from Douglas. Now, I know usually, in most cases, of course, we want to believe the victim. We want to trust the victim. I mean, I'm very passionate about talking about domestic abuse, domestic violence, the red flags and all that. I'm just wondering, in this case, I really wonder, like, was this true at all? You know, is this the police and the judge just like not seeing it or was she making it up? You know what I mean? It, it seems to me like this could be a case where she was um, lashing out at him with these types of things, which we'll, we'll get to. But let me know what you think. Okay. And if you're watching the replay, let me know in the comments. So in August of 2017, Ashley decided to pack up her things. Now she was pregnant, remember? She decided to pack up her things and move to Florida to stay with her mom because she knew that her husband wasn't going to take care of her. There were also two teenagers living in the house, which would be Eva and her friend. Her friend had moved in as well, um, which Eva just said she's not going to get into. That's not her business, which I really respect that she respects her friend's boundaries like that, that she's like, look, I'm not going to I'm not here to tell her story, but she was moving in with us for a while. So there were two teenagers staying in the house and you know, Ashley was just not having it. So she packed up all her things and went to move in with her mom in Florida. Then in September of 2017, she actually returned to the Charleston home to pick up her things. Her mother was also there, by the way. She brought her mom along and she left Doug a note. And in it, she said, okay, wait, let me first read what's on the right. They say during an argument with Ashley about Eva, because Eva was putting the pressure on, on, on from what I'm understanding, right? I hope I'm telling the story right. But it seemed like it was a pressure cooker situation. And she's very demanding, needs his time all the time. He's trying to run a business. There's all this pressure and everything. And then she's shouting about the two teenagers in the house. So Doug 
cracked and he allegedly fired a gun into the kitchen ceiling. He told his cousin it was the dumbest thing he ever did. So he didn't fire the gun at anyone, but he did fire the gun into the ceiling. Okay. So then she wrote a note and said, all these things and more I have overlooked and lived with you for now a year because I love you. But even since finding out I was pregnant, you have continued to display psychotic, irrational and unsafe behavior that has left me fearful for my life and safety as well as that of my unborn child. I mean, it is their unborn child, you know what I mean? Instead of our unborn child, she does write my unborn child, but okay. I've come to get only what belongs to me. Do not harass or try to follow me or I will call the police and have a restraining order against you. I will talk with you only via text starting Tuesday, September 19th. Do not call me or my mom. We will not pick up. Thank you for your, well, thank you for understanding, Ashley. You know? Yes, Marion says it was too much. Live business, yeah. And a, and a new family. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Bad ceiling. Uh, Romulan says, so Ashley wasn't happy about Eva being there. I still think Doug wasn't completely innocent in all of this. I'm not sure, but let me know what you think, right? Okay. Yeah, uh, someone's saying, Ted Green says m manipulation. You know, it's all, this case to me is very interesting. So let's continue on. So that's the note she left. Then she started accusing Doug of poisoning her and the unborn child Emerson and questioned how his second wife really died. But to the point where Ashley and her mother approached Eva and said, your dad is a bad man. He's done very, very bad things. And she's like, what the hell are you talking about? And they said, we think that he poisoned your mom and that's why she died. But the autopsy and, well, the death certificate, right? It wouldn't be a full-blown autopsy because it wasn't an investigation, I believe. It was just, she died from an underlying heart condition. Uh, Eva's mom, Renee, right? Uh, Doug's second wife. But from all the medical findings, they said there was, it was a 75% like artery blockage is what I read. So these are all allegations, you know, it's allegations of suddenly when she's not getting away, she moves to her mom and then she's like, that's a domestic violence, which man. And then she said he's poisoning her. So she said that what he did was buy all these little special um, teacups and a teapot and special teas because they had tea in common as well. And she thought he was poisoning her with a tea. Now, we've, of course, seen many true crime cases, especially recently, where people are putting things in smoothies, you know, they're poisoning things. But I don't know, man, this seems like it could have been in her head. I'm not sure, though. Well, yeah, the poisoning was in her head because she did extensive medical tests and nowhere did any lab or any doctor find that she was being poisoned. So, uh, Ashley insisted on testing strands of her hair for poison, but there was never any evidence that she was poisoned. Three weeks before her due date, she checked herself in to the Tampa General Hospital to test for poisoning. She also said there that Doug was holding her prisoner and stalking her but he was in Florida at the time. So, you know, the hospital wasn't too sure what to make of that. They're like, where is he? She, like, where is he holding you hostage? What's happening? You know, and she's like, oh, he's in Florida. I mean, he was in uh, back home in Charleston. So that's interesting. And then in March of 2018, Emerson was born. Ashley was assigned a new name at the hospital because of all these fears. And the hospital was like, well, I don't know. We don't know what to do. So let's just put her under a name that she was requesting, Christina. And then, you know, after the daughter was born, she signed them up for 26 consecutive days of treatment in a hyperbaric chamber where they spent 40 hours in a 12 person chamber. And this was to rid the body of all toxins, of all heavy metals and toxins and everything. And I just feel so sorry for that baby that was just born. The baby was born three weeks early and they said it was the the hospital said it was the youngest patient they've ever had having this treatment. And you have to have like a special plastic bubble put around you and all that. So to even put her daughter through that, I mean, I don't know, man. When tests showed that they weren't being poisoned, that's a lot. You know, this is now a mental health red flag, I would say. 
So Doug would only find out a month later that his daughter was actually born. And then I was like, wait, what? <laughs> like, how does he not know? It's like nine months. Okay, you've already had kids. So how did he not know? But then they say she was born three weeks early. And no one told, well, you know, no one actually didn't tell him, right? <laughs> Black cat, no, 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 no. <laughs> yes. T Tree says, what prompted the treatment? Right? The the treatment was just prompted by her saying, he's abusing me, he's poisoning me, he's doing this. And she just insisted that she had, she actually did some blood tests, her her attorney says she did some blood tests and like zinc and a couple of other metals in her system were a little high, but it's still, that doesn't go with poisoning, you know, but that was like, that's it. She needs to absolutely just detox her and her newborn, which is quite something. Sandy, the rock, which, uh, welcome to membership. Can you believe all of this? You guys, I'm just like reading all of this still. And I'm like, wait, what? Okay, so Doug would only find out a month later the baby was born three weeks early. He was not listed on the birth certificate. No father was listed because Ashley insisted that no father must be listed. It's her baby and hers alone and that's it. And Ashley said she wanted to raise her daughter alone with her mother. Which her attachment to her mother is also kind of concerning because it's just overbearing. You know, it's like it's a lot. She just wants to be just alone with her mother. She moved there. You know, it's like she runs back to her mother no matter what, you know what I mean? <laughs> okay. Moving on. If you hear the whole case, you understand what I'm saying. Okay. So Doug, he was really trying to make the marriage work. You know, he really tried. So they say that he eventually moved there too, so that he could be with Ashley and Emerson. And he then got Eva her own apartment. But the, rela the relationship remained rocky. And Eva said that Doug and Ashley fought a lot. Yes. So now, remember when Ashley was pregnant, she moved back to live with her mom. And I mean, that's also just abandoning her husband, her new daughter-in-law, right? Eva and the friend and her home that she's just started this life. But also she abandoned the ballet company. So in October 2017, this post was put out on the American National Ballet a Facebook page that said a note from the founder of American National Ballet. I want to start by saying that I am public that I publicly disavow my support for American National Ballet and its leadership. I have been on personal leave and out of state since the end of August and have heard secondhand about the devastation that took place on October 23rd. As the founder, I'm completely devastated by what has been done and the way it was done. The new leadership has destroyed all that we worked so hard to build and I cannot stand behind them or their actions. A and B was created to be different from any other company and was supposed to set a new standard in how it treated its dancers. Everyone involved should be ashamed of themselves for how this was handled. My heart goes out to all those affected by recent cha changes. Each and every dancer brought on uh, possesses amazing talent and potential. The original group assembled was truly diverse in every way, and this is a huge loss for America and for art lovers around the world. As I'm no longer associated with org this organization in any way, please feel free to share your concerns with A&B's leadership. Company COO Beth Bogush, okay, and sincerely Ashley Benefield. So here they say dance, they say American National Ballet fires almost half its dancers only a few weeks into the season. Can you imagine? I feel so sorry for all these dancers. They came from all over the world. They were so excited to start their new ballet career. Like, yes, finally, okay, we included as well. We also went to like all shapes, all sizes, all ethnicities, you know? And so um, you say, I might have missed what occurred on 1023. If we deep dive that, which I did a little bit there, quite a bit, okay, I went down the rabbit hole. What happened was that all the dancers were fired because uh, Ashley had abandoned <laughs> everyone and everything in her company. And just expected Doug to have a full-time job and run the ballet company, which that was very hard for him to do. And basically, the company just kind of fell flat. You know, they just couldn't keep going. Like, how are they supposed to <laughs> keep the finances going and keep everything going? But so I find her post here quite interesting. Like, she's going to jump on and then say all this when really this is actually a personal issue now between her and her husband and the company that failed, which is also her fault because she abandoned everything. Like she's trying to put blame on anyone but herself. You know what I mean? Which also is a red flag for me.
Interesting. Sonny says, quickly look up his father's death on Bleacher from 2017. I'll just scribble that down. If you want to send me an email, grizzlytruecrime at gmail.com, send me the link. Um, maybe I can see it there. Um, 2017, I just want to write here, father's death, just in case. Okay. So anyway, so yeah, the company, shame. I feel so, sorry for all those dancers and I hope they went on to pursue their dreams elsewhere, right? In August of 2019, Ashley showed up to drop off their daughter. Now, oh my word, like this case, you just can't. Every page you turn is just like, what? Okay, okay, here we go. In August of 2019, Ashley showed up to drop off their daughter because, you know, there was this huge custody battle as well. And she was wearing an engagement ring. Oh, yes, indeed. She was wearing a new engagement ring while she was still married to Doug. He was like, what the hell is going on there? Like, what is that? <laughs> it's like, oh, she's seeing someone else. What? Eddie, don't worry. Thank you so much for your $3 super chat. Yes. So, okay, she just arrives and she's like, hi. <laughs> hi, just dropping off the door. He's like, what the hell? So he actually got a private investigator and he investigated whether she was seeing someone or not and she apparently was. She was seeing someone else. So I'm like, right. So Doug then filed for divorce. And in response, what does Ashley do? She then accuses him of physically and sexually abusing their daughter. This is one ugly battle. Like, man. So he's like, that's it. Because, uh, again, she's got a new engagement ring on while she's still married to him. He files for divorce. I think that's the normal thing to do. Yeah, yeah. And she's like, that's it. Okay, she's now going to accuse him. Of physically and sexually abusing their daughter and she called the cps on him a number of times eva says uh doug's daughter right that i'll show you her tiktoks and everything she said that cps was like showing up at the door the whole time like what again like what ag again like what is it she called cps the whole time all she was trying to do the whole time was make sure that she could keep doug away from their daughter so anyway, CPS investigated all of this and they found no evidence of abuse. Doug even had to go for a full psych evaluation. They said he's not dangerous. They don't see anything that she's saying. So you see, with the if you follow the evidence, yeah, to me it seems like she's really the red flag in the room. Like really manipulating the system, lying. It's terrible. This is terrible, right? Okay, so then in the summer of 2020... As toxic relationships go, the pair reconciled again. And then they planned to move to Maryland. So they reconciled and he's like, okay, let's move to Maryland with her mother. The condition was my mom's got to come with us, okay? <laughs> so it was going to be him and her and her mother and their daughter. Uh, the, the one that was just born, right? Emerson. Moving to Maryland. Start fresh. Clean slate. That was the plan, right? Leo, thank you for being a member for seven months. <laughs> T3 says, ultimate drama llama ballerina. <laughs> a little bit, hey? Huh? So he's still trying to make it work. He's still like, don't worry. Like, I'll forgive. Think about it. Like, he's thinking, I'm going to, well, that's what I wonder. Is there any side of the coin that's like him not, he doesn't want to let her go? You know, like that he won't let her go. I'm just wondering about that. Not that it matters. I'm just wondering. I'm a little curious, you know? But at the end of the day, uh, he's forgiving that she's called CPS on him a number of times, that she he's accused her of physical and sexual abuse of their daughter uh, for saying and filing, not just saying that there's domestic abuse going on. She literally filed it, okay? It's all in the court records there, which I was also looking at today, and I'm like, damn, like she literally filed this, and they just kept on saying, we don't find any evidence of this happening, you know? Sure. So he's going to forgive all that. The pair reconciles all his friends and everyone's like, no, the family's like, oh, no, no, no. He's getting back with her. Right. And so they plan to move to Maryland and he gets a U-Haul truck, which is this picture right here. This is literally a picture from when he went there. So September 27th, 2020. After four years of marriage and Ashley exhausting all legal options to keep Doug away from their daughter, an argument occurred around 7 p.m. at Ashley's mother's house in a gated community in White Rock Terrace in Bradenton, Florida. In all previous legal attempts to keep Doug away from their daughter, a judge overseeing the case said there was not a 
and I struggle with that word, scintilla, scintilla of truth, scintilla, scintilla of truth in Ashley's stories and ordered that Doug had visitation rights. So that judge was like, you know what? No amount of truth in this. This is all BS. I order that Doug gets to see his daughter. He completely overruled that. All these things she was filing against him, right? And so she, that means, if you think about it, she kind of lost her little legal plan, her legal battle. You know? And so she's like, okay, it's fine. We'll move to Maryland together. You know, smile, let's pack. So Doug arrived at Ashley's mother's house to help pack a U-Haul truck. And they were set to move the very next morning. Now, it's alleged, and we'll look at the police report as well, that Ashley shot at Doug four times with a 45 caliber handgun while he was picking up the final box to pack into the U-Haul. Everything else was packed. There was one more box and it was in her closet and he wasn't facing her and she is a terrible aim not that we want her to be a good aim but she's like shooting everywhere she shot four times missed twice and she hit him once in the leg and uh one once in the chest oh man she of course you know what she does <laughs> she runs outside to the neighbors with the gun in her hand knocks on the door she's screaming and she's like i i i shot him in self-defense it's kind of like alibi mode already <laughs> like you're running why don't you have a phone in the house it's your mother's house right you're at your mom's house why 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 are you running pick up the phone lady i mean hello this was in 2020 surely she had a cell phone we know because she was sending all the heart emojis after day one i heard about that as well from some of these reports i've been reading it was all like i love you i love you after two or three days so pick up your own damn phone but no she got to run outside she got to take that gun with her and be like i did this you see the gun yeah i shot him in self-defense but the thing is the forensics prove otherwise because there was no amount of his dna at that time on her or under her fingernails or anything they tested and not on him either so they say which is interesting if you say no amount of dna i'm like damn okay like how but uh no Defense wound, she had a little scratch on her arm, but they say they proved that that was from days earlier, uh, from carrying a box or something like that. Hannah, thank you so much. Look at the cat. Thank you so much for your 99 uh, cent in pounds. Super sticker. Really, really appreciate it. Yes, Kevin says running next door with a gun in her hand. Oh, yes. Mm-hmm. Oh, my word. Okay, so responding deputies found Doug alive in a bedroom with a gunshot wound to the leg and one to the chest. And then he was taken to the hospital where he died about an hour later succumbing to his injuries. So yes, there's all of that. Here's a picture of the crime scene do not cross tape at the house. We'll look at the police report in a moment. So we're also going to look at Eva's, um, her telling the story uh, on TikTok which he only posted, I think it was last month, yeah? I think it was May of 2023. We'll look again. But uh, we're going to have a look at that because I would like you to see how she tells the story. And please be kind to her. She's She might be watching, you know. A lot of family members watch um, when we report on cases like this. And oftentimes, I'll get emails either from, you know, the district attorney or law enforcement or the family members just, you know, thanking us all of us as a community here for being so kind so please keep being kind okay okay so the reason i put this here is because it reminds me that every single morning doug eva's dad would send her a bible verse so the day before he was trying to call her and she said i'm busy uh, she was um i think she was 18 at the time right so she was just busy. I think she worked at like a coffee shop, but she's like, I'm, I'm busy and I'll get back to you later. And she just thought, you know what? Tomorrow he's going to send me the Bible verse and we'll chat again and we'll catch up, right? But that day, that next day, he, she did not get the normal text from him. So she started freaking out because it was such a routine. He would always send her like an inspiring, encouraging Bible verse, right? So then she said, good morning. Hello. You're kind of scaring me. Our phones were shut off again. You should definitely text me so I know you're okay. About to text Ashley and all that. So we're going to see that as well, right? So when she was told, she says in a 48 hours interview, which I would recommend checking out as well. She said, and I said, what's wrong with my dad? And he said, that's um, Doug's 
cousin, I believe, but they say it was actually Eva's uncle, right? There's been an accident. And I said, she killed him, didn't she? And he said, yeah, she shot him twice. Now on the interview, they say, whoa, was that the first thing out of your mouth? And they say, yeah. Eva said, yeah, because she could see the couple fighting the whole time. She never trusted Ashley. She didn't like her. And she was like, oh my word. Basically, like, she's a red flag. So when she's like, oh, man, she heard there's been an accident. I'm so sorry. She's like, oh, man, she killed him, right? Oh, wow. That was just, it must, it's just, and remember, she lost her mom in 2015. Yes, she died from an underlying heart condition. And now this 20, she was 28 at the time, 28-year-old, 27-year-old Ashley shot her dad. Damn. And Eva is so strong. Sure. Violet Gracie, thank you so much for your $10 super chat. I really appreciate it. So then, yes, and it's so sad. His poor daughter says Savannah. Yes, Eva and Emerson. And by the way, um, Emerson is currently with Ashley's mom. And also, by the way, Ashley was, she was arrested on November 4th, 2020. That was five weeks or so later. Um, and charged with second degree murder. But you know what? Yeah, she got a bond and she 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 bonded out. So she's out. From my understanding, from everything I read, she's not in jail right now. She's out. But I think they took her passports from what I could see from the court records. So she, got, she's, she can't fly anywhere, but she's out and about probably living with her mom. But anyway, um, Eva was saying when this case goes to trial, they really hope that their family can get full custody of Emerson. Which I think is also very sweet to, to even think of at this point, you know, to say, because it's obviously, I'm in shame, poor little Emerson. Wow. So, yes, there's that, which is just like, <laughs> the story is unbelievable. And what Eva's gone through, whoa. So they say she didn't speak to detectives at all. As of today, she's never given any kind of statement to law enforcement. But... Ashley's mother, Alicia, told detectives that she and her daughter were victims of domestic abuse and had been living in fear of Doug for three and a half years. She claimed that they had tried to get help, but nobody would help them. You see, that I find interesting. Is the mother enabling Ashley? Is she believing her stories or is there something more to the story? Like, is there any validity to this? I'm just not sure what to think, you know? Dana says, this sounds like a plot for a movie. I know. Thank you so much, Dana, for your super sticker. I, I agree, right? So that's interesting. And Ashley's lawyer, Faith Brown, told detectives that Ashley was creating an escape plan to get away from Doug once and for all. Brown told detective that Ashley was in, in danger. She had a psychologist. She had two attorneys and a burner phone. And Ashley also had a safe location and a rental car set up. Ashley was expected to implement the plan the very next day because as Ashley's lawyer told a detective, she was very concerned that Doug was getting wind of the plan. Man, I always want to give victims of domestic violence, of course, like real victims, really the benefit of the doubt, man. But in this case, I'm just not sure about this. Uh, Janet Tucker says, this has me so mad. I don't know where to place my... <laughs> Is that your rage, right? Yes, your anger. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much uh, for your super chat. Yeah, this case is a lot. So um, Plain Jane says, women like her are dangerous, so dangerous. And Brenda says, I think her mother's her guidance. It seems it seems like it, right? Wow. Okay, and so, I mean, did she have a plan or what was going on there? We've still got more to look in. We're going to look at the documents. We're going to look at uh, Eva's TikTok telling of her story as well. So Eva said, I just want to know, why would she take away my father, my best friend, knowing that I don't have another parent? She said also, so keep this in mind for when you see her TikTok. She says, I use dark humor. I just, I don't know. I guess it's the way my brain's wired. But I'd rather not sit and sulk. I'd rather just make light of a situation. These days, Eva cherishes her time with Sully, the dog who once belonged to her father. And she and Tommy, her uncle, still go to the beach at Sullivan's Island where her father... Some water quickly. Interesting. And Jeanette says pregnancy could have easily been that life-changing event that triggers some mental illness or at least amplifies it. Hormones plus already feuding brain. Interesting as well. Yeah. 
So keep this in mind that yes, Eva does have like dark humor and she does seem to yeah, you know, make light of the situation, but it's her coping mechanism. She's very, very young. I mean, she was 15 when her dad met Ashley and 18 when he was killed. And she was also 15 when she lost her mother, right? So that's a lot. And she's channeling everything into creativity. She's launched a t-shirt company, which she is extremely successful. Um, it's called Ghost Cowboy, which we can also look at. And she's got her own studio apartment that she said she's never been given a handout. She had $15 in her bank account when she found out her dad was also gone. No one to help her or look after her. She built herself up from the ground up, right? And people ask about life insurance. Did her dad have life insurance? Her dad's life insurance um, expired three day. Uh, sorry, three months. Wait, is it three months? I just want to see if it's three months or weeks. Wait, life insurance ended three months before. <laughs> three months before. So yes, she didn't get any life insurance or anything like that. Yes, and if you were thinking maybe from earlier, I've just got some notes here as well. Um, when I said she was maybe, I think she was working at like a coffee shop, right? Um, instead of finishing up or, you know, going going to college at the time, is because it was the pandemic, you know? So she said to her dad, well, seeing as everything's going to be online anyway, I might as well just get a part-time job and do that. And then once that's all over, then I'll go to college. So there's that. Yes. Oh, and by the way, I should have read some of these notes through it as well. When... Ashley abandoned everyone and everything, including the ballet company. And the ballet company then went under. She was so resentful, Ashley. She said, you took my ballet company away from me. So it feels like Ashley is driven by, you know, revenge. It's like that woman scorn thing, but like to the highest degree. That's what it sounds like to me, this case, right? Okay. So we have that. Now, let's look at some documents, shall we? All right, so here we go. <laughs> I really enjoy finding all of these for you. All the way from the Netherlands, hey? <laughs> Thank you, America. <laughs> Thank you so much, Brenda. You say you love my necklace. Thank you. Okay, so State of Florida versus Ashley Christina Benefield. Before me, a judge of the circuit court in and for Manatee County, Florida, Detective Justin Warren. And the rest I won't read there, but it's the 27th of September, 2020. On 9 2020 John Sant contacted 911, that was the neighbor, right? And reported that his neighbor, Ashley Benefield, had just run over to his residence and told him that she'd been attacked by her husband, Douglas Benefield, and that she'd shot him. John Sant confirmed that the shooting took place at Ashley's residence, which is located at, okay, White Rock Terrace, Bradenton, Florida. John Sant also told the dispatcher that the weapon used was currently at his residence. John Sant remained on the phone. It was at his residence. Okay. Uh, John Sant remained on the phone and in the presence of Ashley until she was directed to go out and meet with deputies. John then directed deputies to the firearm, which was still inside his residence. Yes, docu-time. Wildfire says men can have trauma bonds too, right? This is a very toxic trauma bond too. Yes. Marina said, did she know the insurance was expired? Can anyone answer that? Oh, I also wondered when I heard that. Okay, so to continue on with this, they say, uh, wait, currently it is raising. John remained on the phone and in the presence of Ashley until she was directed to go out and meet with the deputies. John then directed deputies to the firearm, which was still inside his residence. Responding deputies entered the house at White Rock Terrace and began to render aid to Douglas Benefield, who was found on the floor of Ashley's bedroom. Douglas was moved to the living room where deputies uh, continued to render aid. Douglas had two gunshot wounds visible on his person. The wounds were located on his right leg, right arm and right chest area. Douglas was eventually transported by EMS to the nearest hospital. Douglas succumbed to his injuries and was pronounced deceased at 20.09 hours, so just past 8 p.m. A search warrant was obtained for the residence, and during the execution, it was discovered that a total of four shots were fired. Four 45 caliber casings were located on the floor in Ashley's bedroom. A loose projectile was also found on the floor, and two more were found embedded in the walls of the residence. Ashley was transported to CID by patrol for an interview. Prior to her arrival, Ashley's legal counsel had already arrived. She lawyered up real quick, okay? Yes. 
I mean, smart, but still, she would light up real quick. <laughs> Ashley and counsel advised that she did not wish to make a statement at this time, and to this day, she still hasn't, right? Ashley did, however, make a spontaneous statement to me, advising that her ears were still ringing. She was shown to the interview room so that she could confer with her counsel. As we walked to the interview room, I did not observe Ashley to have any injuries, nor did I observe any ripped, torn, or stretched out clothing. Because she's like, oh my word, he attacked me, right? Yes. Uh, Savannah says she just wanted a baby. That's what I think. She never wanted him to be in the picture. I could be wrong, but she just wanted to get rid of him any way she could. Her accusations weren't doing it. I also got that feeling. Yes. So Ashley was uh, not making any statements, telling the police, oh, I've still got ringing in my ear. Yeah, from those gunshots. Like, oh, wow. It's the whole poor me syndrome, isn't it? <laughs> Shame. Poor me. My ears are ringing. Like, wow. Okay. Sure. Okay, so she was shown this, and as we walked to the interview room, I did not observe Ashley to have any injuries, nor did I observe any ripped, torn, or stretched out clothing. Narrative continued. A search warrant was obtained for photographs as well as DNA from Ashley's person. I reviewed the photographs and spoke with a crime scene technician. No injuries aside from a minor scratch on her right side were visible. The scratch appeared to be old and very minor. Upon further investigation, a witness explained that Ashley had obtained the scratch on her right side uh, the day before the shooting when she was inadvertently scratched when someone walked by her carrying a box. Douglas was found to have been shot twice. One of the rounds entered the outside of his right leg and exited the inside of his right leg. The other round appeared to have uh, skipped across the right bicep and entered his chest cavity from the right side. No signs of stippling were observed on Douglas or his clothing, indicating that the firearm was several feet away when it was fired. Based on the entry wounds on Douglas, it does not appear that he was facing Ashley when she began shooting. It also does not appear that Douglas had taken any kind of defensive or combative stance. After being shot, Douglas fell to the ground and it appears that he may have struck his head on the wall on the way down. Douglas did have an abrasion on the back of his head, which was about the same size as a small patch of disturbed drywall on the eastern wall of the bedroom. Douglas was not found to have any weapons on his person or near him. On 10-01-2020, a second search warrant for photographs was executed on Ashley for any delayed injuries that may have not been visible on the night of the shooting. No injuries were observed, like bruising and things, right? They checked later to see, well, let's see if there's any bruising that's happening or what's going on. Uh, Marion... Mary New Blumenberg, thank you so much for being a member for four months. Yes. Right. Okay. Um, and so, no torn clothes, no rip clothes, no injuries, and she's only saying ringing in the ear, and that's that's about it, right? Okay. So when we continue on, yes, the drywall. So it just sounds like he, yeah, he was you know, shot when he least expected it. Numerous requests have been made through Ashley's legal counsel to set up an interview to discuss what occurred in the room that night. As of this writing, Ashley has not provided a statement or interview. Still not. Man, okay. During this investigation, it was found that since the time Ashley found out that she was pregnant with the child that she and Douglas share, she's made several allegations against Douglas. While looking into the outcomes of numerous cases, it was found that they had never resulted in criminal charges and were furthermore closed as unfounded. None of the cases involved the allegation of physical domestic violence. Based on these cases and Ashley's actions leading up to the murder of Douglas Benefield, it appears that the main focus of these complaints was to keep the child away from Douglas. In one of the most recent cases, Ashley and Douglas went before the Honorable Judge Moreland for an injunction hearing. During that hearing, Judge Moreland openly advised that she did not find Ashley's story to possess a scintilla of truth. Judge Moreland further ordered Douglas to have access to the child for visitation. At this point, it appears that Ashley had exhausted all legal means of keeping the child away from Douglas before the shooting. So yes, that's what we have. I just want to see what this one is. This is the arrest warrant. And I just find it funny that here she said homeless <laughs> when she was arrested. She's like, homeless. Okay. And this one was for the charge of murder in the second degree. Will be amended to murder in the second degree with a firearm. 
Okay, that was on the 16th day of November. So it's been a while, huh? This is from 2020. Like, yes, trial time. Yes, you guys, trial time. Okay. For all of you complaining about the name, it just takes reading the title carefully. If you want to assume that it's somebody else, it isn't. It's Ashley Benefield. So please look at it. It's com spelled completely differently. Um, I don't know if you guys remember when I covered the Moses Sitole case, which is from South Africa. And some of you thought it was Moses Shithole, which it isn't. It's Sitole. So just read the title and it should be very, very clear. Okay. So now we've read through all the documents. Now what I'm going to show you is <laughs> some videos. Okay, wait for it. First, I want to show you. Okay, wait for this. First, go here. Yeah, this one. Okay, so this is uh, Eva's TikTok account. Um, I just want to go. I don't want to lose my place there. Wait, wait, wait. Eva, the freaking diva, is what her account is called. You can see it there. Okay, it's public. And I just want to, I just want to show it to you guys. Yeah, Rochelle says the title is clear. There's just people whinging about it in the chat, which I'm like, come on, man. It's not my fault you can't read. <laughs> just read it. <laughs> Instead of accusing me of being so sinister. How could I? How could I put the actual defendant's name in? the? <laughs> Are you also going to go shout at Law and Crime Network? Hmm? And Kendall Ray and just everybody else with the same name in the title. Okay. <laughs> Okay, moving on from the snark. Thank you so much. Thank you for supporting for a month, Shannon. Now, let's look at, uh, I just got to find my place again, which is here. Okay, so there is a, if you're on TikTok, I'm on TikTok, by the way. <laughs> I don't think many of you are. Are you on TikTok? There's a trend on TikTok where it's like the song, you know, um, it's like it sounds like a like a church song, right? But then people tell this story with a text with the song, and it's just like you can't believe your life. Like what the hell happened to me? So she, this has got twenty one point three million views, right? So she first shared this, and then people were like, uh, "Are you doing okay?" And then so Eva answered the question in a five part series: one, two, three, four, five. Actually, six parts. Wait, and then seven. Yeah, so seven of them. So we're going to look at those, okay? Now I'm just going to quickly put this on and pause it so that I can resize it nicely for you. We want to make it nice for you. So my disclaimer here is Eva herself said she's got a, you know, she's got dark humor. She uses comedy to cope and lightheartedness. So please keep that in mind. Please be kind to her. Don't judge her. Uh, she hasn't done anything wrong. And she's very young and just sharing her story. Okay. So, yes, I'm just checking what you guys are saying before we start. <laughs> yes. All right. I'm just checking quickly. Are we in the world right now? Interesting. And I also want to share one more thing after this with you. Actually, two more, two or three more things, two or three more. So stay with me if you're here. Make sure you do like the video, please, and share it as well. Hashtag Ashley Benefield. Okay, make sure you guys spell it right. Is what's being used on social media to categorize everything together as hopefully the trial happens this year. They say summer 2023. Michaela Knight says you are doing a great job. G. Thank you so much. And thank you. Whoa, for 19 months. Damn. Oh, thank you so much for supporting for 19 months. Oh, gee. Okay. Uh, and Ryan says, what a strange case. Sounds like she may have had a long-term agenda, but probably thought it would end sooner. I also wonder. And Jean says, we all cope differently. Exactly. I agree. Okay, so let's listen to story time part one. We're going to listen to all six parts. I hope that you can hear, right? Guys, I know all you little sewer rats want a story time. So I'm going to give it to you. I even pulled up my chair. Um, and so first of all, for this comment, short answer, yes, long answer, no. Um, okay, so when I was 15, my mom died of an underlying heart condition, and then, um, my, so basically my dad was out of town, and then I came home from school, and I found her, so that was the start of a lot of trauma. Um, and then, after that, my dad came home, 
and he specifically told me, don't worry, Eva, I'm never going to get married again. Well, he didn't use those exact words, but that's how I remember it. And then after that, <clears throat> um, nine months later, he married, he was like, it was a Friday after school, and he married, he, no, it was a Friday after school, and he was like, so I'm seeing this girl, and I was like, okay and then he picked her up from the airport the next day and i met her and he was like she's super cool she's a model and a ballerina and i was like okay like cool she's kind of hot but i don't see the hype she's 23 dude like come on um but then i was like all right well you're allowed to date like you're a single man i get it um and then the next day he was like we need to have a family meeting and i was like mm, no because we're not a family and the only thing that you would be, should have to tell me is if you propose and as soon as those words came out of my mouth he goes we're married and i was like what um so i drove myself even though i only had my permit if you're a cop please don't arrest me this was years ago i only had my permit and i drove myself to my best friend's house and i was like guys uh, my dad's actually married to this little skank, and he, they were like, what? And then I was like, yeah, and I told, I have two older, like, half-brothers, they're on my mom's side, though, and I told them, and they're like, she's younger than us, and I was like, I know, um, and so then, after that, I just kind of, like, tried to get used to her, but she was, like, totally not that nice, she was cool at first, but then she wasn't, and here's why, I only have three minutes, anyways, here, this is, like, a, there's gonna be a part two, don't worry, but, um, I was like, so fuck hold on so then um i tried to get used to her because i was like okay well like this is reality he's married and so then um she at first she was nice and then she kind of would like twist my words and make my dad get mad at me keep in mind me and my dad were like very close like since my mom died we uh, me and my dad were always close i was always like like my dad's me and my dad were just best friends i was close to my mom too but like me and my dad like had a different level kind of bond and so when she did this, it really, like, affected me and my dad's friendship slash father-daughter relationship, um, and that didn't cut it on my end, so I became a little bitch back, and actually, all right, I'm gonna do a part two. Okay. Okay, so now we're gonna watch part two. Just wanted to point out that Eva is the one who found her mother. Her dad was out of town uh, for work at the time, she just come home from school. She couldn't get in the house. She was like knocking on the door and like opening and running around the house. And she looked through the blinds and everything. And eventually she went in the house and found her mother no longer alive. So, I mean, that what a lot of trauma that must have been as well. Right. OK, so now let's look at part two. OK, so here's part two. Um, basically, after that, I um, so I was being a brat, but like. I look I was an ideal child at this point I was 16 I had worked out every single morning before school eight hours of school then two hours of lacrosse practice like I barely got any in, in, into any trouble I, until like maybe when I was like 17 or 18 but like come on I had to try my first beer and whatnot um god why did I wink like that I didn't really get into trouble ever I was a good kid anyway so she was being a brat acting like my mom and I was like you're not my mom at all and my dad was like no, dude, like, you need a mother figure, and I was like, no, I already have a mother figure, so, like, I don't need this 23-year-old who's younger than my actual mother figure, who, keep in mind, it's my sister-in-law, my sister-in-law, like, really stepped up and helped me out to, like, fill in for where I needed a mother figure at these crucial developing ages when I was 16, anyways, um, so then, I'm just kind of rambling, I'm sorry, this is gonna be, like, an eight-part story, even though I literally have a shorter story time down below, but I figured this is more fun, I have my chair, it's like, I'm telling I get my kids a little story um so then after that um we took in one of my friends she ended up living with me because she needed a place to stay and that's like m not my business so that's what I'm gonna keep it at and um then it was awesome like things with Ashley kind of sucked but I was like whatever because like I have my best friend living with me and I, I'm in high school so I'm like having a great time making all these friends um, and then shortly after she moved in, Ashley and my dad came upstairs one night and they were like, Hey, y'all are going to have a little, so you said, uh, you're my friend. I'm not going to use her real name her. Um, so I'm going to pretend her name is, uh, surfboard surfboard Eva. Um, you have a little sister on the way. And we were like, what Ashley's pregnant, which is weird because after Ashley and him got married, my dad got his tubes tied. Um, and then I guess they, or he, before 
they got married, he got his tube tied, tubes tied after they got married, she was like, you should, like, like, reverse it, and my dad was like, okay, and apparently it wasn't, they weren't supposed to be able to have a kid for a while, but then, boom, they had a kid, so, there was a little baby on the way, and I was like, are you kidding me, like, dad, come on, I, I can't catch a break, this is freaking bullshit, um, and so then, after that, like, we were just dealing with Ashley, who was a t having a terrible pregnancy, she was sick all the time, and my dad was at work, because he already had his job, and she convinced my dad to start an international ballet company, so they started, like, a whole, it was, like, this huge project, and then she got pregnant, and so then my dad had to do all the work, because Ashley was, like, sick all the time. Okay, so here's... Okay, now let's have a look at part three. Okay, part three. Where did I leave off? Um, so my, she was having a terrible pregnancy. My dad was managing this, um, this like crazy international ballet company that uh, like apparently was like a huge deal. Um, and so he was stressed out and I was stressed out cause he was stressed out and Ashley was like having a terrible pregnancy. And, um, anyway, so then Ashley decides that she's going to go live with her mom in Florida for the time being. Um, because she was having such a bad pregnancy, like, she was, like, just sick all the time. Well, I don't know. I don't, I've never been pregnant, so I don't really know, like, how bad they can get, but I guess you, they can get very bad, like, the symptoms and stuff. Um, so she went down to stay with her mom in Florida because my dad didn't have the time to take care of her juggling all of these things. Keep in mind, also, me and surfboard were still living in my house, like, and we had, all of these high school things that my dad had to like attend 10 for so a 10 for anyways um so she went down to florida and my like things got better because she was out of the picture for me and my dad me and my dad were so freaking close so i was like i was like cool ashley's not here anymore um and then one day it was like probably a couple months later i came home from school and my dad wasn't home and neither was surfboard and um ashley's car was just like gone from the driveway which was weird because surfboard and i drove to school in her car that morning and so my car was parked behind ashley's car somehow her car was gone even though she was parked in basically um and then i went inside and all of her stuff was gone too and then there was a note on the bed and i was like fuck all right i'm gonna have to pick up all the pieces i know exactly what happened so my dad came home he read the note and i have never seen that man other than the time that he cried at my mom's funeral he i could just see like the hurt in his eyes he felt betrayed he didn't say anything but like he i could tell he was upset um so she left him and then i was like i kind of for a while like things were weird and then things got really good me and my dad were like super close at this point um surfboard had moved out also at this point i think so it was just me and my dad we were super close but then but then ashley started calling cps on my dad um so i would get like like my dad was out of town all the time because he traveled a lot so i would get like first of all i was living home alone essentially in this um huge house that like has lots of doors and windows which isn't like i was fine with that i was very like i was very mature for my age and i knew how to, my dad had been traveling for years anyways um, and I also had like my sis, my half sis, my, my half siblings and their wives in town. Um, so I, CPS started showing up at my door every single day, which I was like, what the hell? And then cops started showing up too. So I was like, what the heck? I'm running out. Okay. Part three. Where did I leave off? All right. So part four, um, then CPS and the police were showing up at my house like every single day. Um, and so I would call my dad. Well, I remember one day specifically, the police were like crawling around my house and I called my dad. I was freaking out. I was like, dude, something's going on. So he called the neighbor and the neighbor came out and I like snuck through the back door, got in my Jeep and like ran, went, the neighborhood was really small. I went around the neighborhood just so I could like see the front. Cause I didn't like, what if there was an intruder in the house and like, I didn't see it, but somebody else saw, I don't know. I freaked out cause I have anxiety. Um, and so I went and I started talking to the cops and they were like, do you have firearms in here? And I was like, I'm not talking to y'all until my dad gets here. Sorry. Um, so then my dad got there and things were cleared up, but then for some reason I had to like move out of my house for a couple month period of time just because I had to live with my, my brother. Um, I don't really know why. Also a lot of this, like I did repress like a lot of this time period just because like 
It was pretty traumatic. I would think I was like 17 at this, 16 or 17. No, I was definitely 17 at this point, or maybe almost 18. I don't know. Um, so then I, things were like fine. Me and my dad were still super close, but I moved out. And then the summer before senior year, I moved back in with my dad. I remember that. And then me and my dad still awesome, like doing great. He apparently had reconciled his relationship with Ashley and um, they, he would go down to Florida periodically. And then um, I did like one semester of senior year and my dad was traveling between like all the states that he had to go to all the time. And then he also was traveling to Florida to be with Ashley and the baby who I think was born at this point, but I asked my dad to keep me out of the, the like keep me out of their relationship because that had caused so much trauma. Um, and he respected me because we were so close that he did not tell me anything. He'd occasionally show me pictures of the baby because he did eventually want me and the baby to have a relationship. Um, and so I was fine with that, but I never really asked questions about him and Ashley. I just assumed they were fine. So then he decided to move to Florida full time because I was at this point 18 and I was about to start college here in Charleston. And so he was like, I'm just going to get you your own apartment. And I yes, I was I'm not going to lie. I was a spoiled brat. And keep that in mind, because things also get really crazy in later parts. So keep in mind, Eva was kind of a spoiled. I mean, like I had a job and stuff like I'd pay for some of my own things. But my dad essentially paid for everything, which I'm very grateful for. Um, anyways, he moved to Florida. I stayed here. Things were great. He texts me every single morning. He texts me a Bible verse. Um, and so that's when I knew he was awake. And when I responded, um, he knew I was awake. And so then he would call me, check in for the day, see what I needed, see what he could do. Um, all right. And now it's part five. So, um, then, so he was in Florida, he was respecting me and like, he was texting me every morning. We had a great relationship. Um, I'd see him occasionally. I started college and then after, after um, my freshman year of college, COVID hit. And so I decided that I was not going to go back to school for the time being because um, it, I didn't want my dad to pay for tuition when I knew I was just going to cheat on everything since everything was going to be online. Um, so he was like, no, that's cool. And so then I was working full time. And one day he didn't text me a good morning slash Bible verse. Um Sorry, quick intermission. My friend Ava just got here. <laughs> so, um, then he, so he hadn't sent me a Bible verse that morning or a good morning. So I freaked out a little bit because when my mom died, she didn't answer her phone either. And then I found her. Um, so I called him. No answer. I texted him a lot, actually. Um, here, I'll just show you. So, like, this is what I texted my dad that morning because he didn't, like, you know, answer. So, immediate gut feeling, I knew something was wrong because that was so not normal. Even though AT&T, like, I have AT&T and the cell towers were kind of down that day for some reason. Like, they had been, like, not doing well the past few weeks. So, some, like, sometimes my phone would, like, shut off completely. Um, and anyway, so... Then I went to my, my sister-in-law's house because it was really close to the job that I was going to start that day. Um, and then my uncle called me and he was like, hey, Eva, we have some bad news. And I was like, he's dead, isn't he? And they were like, how did you know? And I was like, I just had a gut feeling. Did she kill him? And he was like, yeah, Ashley shot and killed him. Um, and so I kind of just drove to my friend's house after that. And I sat down on his porch and all my friends were there. And I looked at them and I was like, so Ashley killed my dad. And they were like, oh my God, what are we going to do with you? And I was like, I don't know. I don't have parents anymore. Um, and, and then, so um, that's basically it. If you have any questions, drop them down below. Um, I am 21 now and I'm doing all right. Um, but if you ever need life advice, I've kind of experienced a lot. And I actually only had $15 in my bank account when all this happened. Um, and I've never taken a handout from anyone. And so I've, I'm now living in this super tiny lavish studio and living through a recession. So I think I know a thing or two, um, but I'm doing okay. You should go buy Ghost Cowboy. That's the sweatshirt. All right, bye guys. Okay, we'll quickly listen to part six and Ghost Cowboy is the company that she started. So we'll go over that after this, okay? Okay, so like I forgot to mention that, um, so she shot and killed him. 
Um, she said that she, it was out of self-defense because he was attacking her, but then um, forensics and the detectives discovered that there was no DNA, like his DNA wasn't anywhere to be found on her, and her DNA was anywhere to be found on wasn't anywhere to be found on him. So they're like, he didn't attack you, and um, and then she like she pled the fifth, I think. But then the mom, her mom, now has full custody of the kid. She went to jail for 17 days, but then got out on house arrest. And the trial has not started yet. The pretrial was supposed to be like last January, and then like January of 2021. And then, why does my phone keep doing this? Um, January of 2021, and then that didn't happen, and it keeps getting pushed. And they haven't even like started the depositions or anything. Like I haven't even been deposed. Which is kind of fucked up if you t if you're asking me, because like I kind of just want the trial to be over, because I want either her to go to jail, no, I want her to go to jail, um, and now there's like a bunch of documentaries coming out about it, and maybe you'll see my life story on Netflix one day. Let's hope, because I actually think that it would make like a great version of y'all know the movie King of Staten Island. <laughs> I think that it could be like that with a really good soundtrack because I love Kanye, but better because it's like funnier. Not even funnier, even though I did write a stand-up set. Um, I'm just rambling at this point, so there's that. But it would be like King of Staten Island, but like a murder mystery. Ooh. Okay, that's it. <laughs> okay, so like I... Nope. I didn't get any life insurance. <laughs> I, um, so when my mom died, my dad, like, they were like, oh, we should only just do one person, and my dad thought he was gonna die first, because men are idiots, and they usually, they do die first, um, but then my mom died first, and my dad was like, fuck, so he raised his life insurance in case he died, and then, um, I guess it, like, it ended three months before he died, and he stopped paying, he, like, didn't renew it, so, like, when I found those papers, I was like, this close I was like I was this fucking close but then no nope, no life insurance and so I um I'm here I can proudly say that I got to where I'm at right now with lots of love from my my support system but all by myself financially I worked my butt off and yes financial times I'm still in the hard ones because I'm 21 I have no idea how to budget my money, I overspend because I love shopping, um, but I'm somehow paying my rent every month, um, and I did move five times last year, and now I'm here living alone, because I figured out I don't like having roommates, so yeah, um, but long story short, no, I didn't get life insurance, short story short, do you have a good relationship with your sibling, I actually haven't seen my sibling, because she's in custody with the mom, um, the grandma, not Ashley, the grandma, and so I, like, eventually we're gonna try and get custody of her, um, but right now, because everything is just such a legal shit show, like, there, there, we can't, like, it's just CPS sees her, the grandma, as, like, a, she didn't do anything, so she's a good fit, since she's, like, blood-related, even though I'm blood-related, but, like, I don't know, it's a whole thing, I'm trying to, like, honestly, just stay out of it as much as possible until the trial's over, because there's just so much, like, so much to unpack, if that makes sense, like, my dad left, like, kind of a shitstorm behind, and now I'm dealing with it, because, um, nobody else can deal with it except for me, and, like, I have a few family members that are being a huge help as well, but they have their own lives, and so do I, so it's kind of just, like, a really long, gruesome process to get everything over with. Thank you. Okay, everyone, so that's Eva's TikTok. I have put it in the description box as well if you want to check it out. She's got lots of other posts. There's one other one. I just want to see if I can find it quick. If I can't, then I'll just, you can just follow the link there. Where was it? Mm, there's one where she's like doing almost like a handstand type thing. Nope. Sorry. Wait. Where is it? She just, it was like at Ashley. Then you could see she was a little bit angry there for sure. Like, I can't imagine what she's going through. Good morning, guys. I'm at the office and somebody on Instagram tagged me in this. I have no idea who this guy is, but I think it's a little funny. 
nope nope not that one sorry about that just follow the link okay if you do have tiktok and then you can see for yourself all her posts she posts lots of things she's actually she designs t-shirts so let me show you that oh that's from dance magazine sorry there we go okay here we go let me resize this for you so sure she's been through a lot oh my word okay so they say her her dad's Killing made headlines, now she's creating content about it, right? Eva Benfield, Benefield is just 21 years old and already the joint owner of a clothing brand called Ghost Cowboy. The business venture began in March when Benefield, a South Carolina native, came up with the idea or an idea for a t-shirt. At the time, she was working in sales at e-commerce brand United Monograms, which sells graphic clothing and growing her TikTok account at Eva the freaking diva on the side. Koala Girl Rasmussen, thank you so much for your 399 super sticker. Yeah, her shirts are very cool. I've seen them as well. Um, so they say Benefield uh, proposed creating a t-shirt from a famous selfie, the one that comedian Pete Davidson took from his then girlfriend Kim Kardashian's bed and texted to her former husband Kanye West. She figured that it would do well if she promoted it on her TikTok. The company went for it. Her video about the tea ended up attracting more than 700,000 views and the item generated $50,000 in sales. The shirt's success inspired Benefield and her boss, Sean Lowry, the 33-year-old founder and owner of South Carolina-based e-commerce group Lowry Brands, which owns United Monograms, to launch a brand through which Benefield could sell her designs, and they named it Ghost Cowboy. A few weeks after we started, she walked in with a, t a tattoo of the Ghost Cowboy logo on her upper arm, recalls Lowry, who co-owns the brand with her, right? She told me we were taking things to the top. That's commitment right there. Benefield herself draws many of Ghost Cowboy's designs, including an It's Corn sweatshirt commemorating the recent viral sensation Tariq the Corn Boy. Oh, you say uh, the link wouldn't work for your TikTok? Well, it's Eva at Eva the freaking diva. On TikTok. Uh, Ghost Cowboy has been a success, largely thanks to Benefield's TikTok account, where most days she promotes her designs to more than 300,000 followers. A great number of her fans, however, don't come for the shirts. They're there for the videos in which Benefield talks about her past. In 2015, she was just 15. When Benefield discovered the body of her mother, Renee, who had died at their Charleston, South Carolina home from an undiagnosed heart condition. Nine months later, in 2016, her widowed father, Doug, then 54, married a 24-year-old woman, Ashley Byers, whom he'd known for only a few weeks. Byers took Doug's last name. In 2020, Ashley Benefield shot Doug with a 45 caliber handgun at her mother's residence in Lakewood Ranch, Florida. Doug died from his injuries an hour later at a local hospital. In the months that followed, the case garnered international attention. Eva sees TikTok as a way to explain her dark family history on her own terms, which usually means comedy and memes. Humor, she says, is her coping mechanism. This February 2021 video, which was filmed to fit with a SpongeBob audio clip, popular on TikTok, garnered more than 23 million views. But she avoided getting into too much detail until August of this year when she posted another joke about her past, which segued into an eight-part account of the circumstances surrounding her father's death. Combined, those videos have amassed more than 20 million views. Eva says that she finally felt comfortable speaking out thanks to the support of her close friends and remaining family. They all find they all find it really funny, she said. We all laugh about it because I don't censor myself in my videos. Her forthrightness is evident. I kind of just want the trial to be over because I want either her to go to jail. No, I wanted to go to jail. Benefield said of Ashley in one of her videos. She doesn't linger on negative emotions for long, however. Maybe they'll see my story on Netflix one day, you know. <laughs> you all know the movie of the King of Staten Island, and we saw this now together, right? We saw her videos. More recently, Benefield launched a podcast called Eva Unfiltered, so you can check that out as well, to give followers additional glimpses into her life, although she hasn't decided what the show might be like past her introductory episode. What I discuss, she says, of both her podcast and her TikTok account is guided by people's responses to it. For now, as she awaits the trial, which has been delayed until at least 2023, they say now summer 2023, Benefield is trying to focus on herself and her community. She says she's found a sense of purpose thanks to her social media presence. I've gotten so many DMs recently from people saying my videos helped them somehow, which is really why I'm so grateful for TikTok and the platform that I have, she said in her podcast debut episode. The fact that people have told me I make them feel less alone warms my heart so much. 
Although the media frenzy surrounding Doug Benefield's death began in 2020, it attracted significant attention across much of last year. One of the most in-depth stories was a lengthy feature in Vanity Fair, which I would highly recommend you guys reading. I'm not going to read that right now because it will be another probably 90 minutes to get through that, right? But it's a really good article and I will link it for you in the description box afterwards. So that uh, was published last fall, which featured the subheadline, The Charleston-based evangelicals had much in common. Guns, God, Trump. What went wrong? Only one of them could say. Eva says she was heartbroken by the... F oh, okay, okay. She was heartbroken by the framing of the Vanity Fair story which she participated in. And that's the problem. I've seen that happen a few times, right? They say they politicized the whole thing, which is very unfair because the full incident wasn't political, she says. My father was my best friend and I thought hundreds of thousands of people were going to think badly about him. Oh man, the facts of the case are this. After getting married, Doug and Ashley, a former ballerina and Trump campaigner, attempted to launch a diverse ballet company for unconventional dancers, but the endeavor fell apart as problems in their marriage arose. You see, now the rest here we've gone through, we know it, okay? We know it. We just did a whole deep dive on it for the last however long we've been here together. Here's some pictures of Doug and Renee that would be Eva's mom. She died of an underlying heart condition, okay? So, yes, we've got we, this, all of the story we've gone through as well. Benefield uh, being interviewed for an upcoming network television segment. So we will we'll have a look at that. And they say Benefield's followers have been so enamored by her TikTok presence that they've been bombarded her with offers of cash and assistance, hoping to help her move through life without her parents. People offered to start a GoFundMe to get me a house. They wanted to support me, but I don't want to just take people's money. I told them if they want to support me, they can buy a t-shirt from my brand, Benfield says. There was definitely an uptick in sales after I did my videos. Although Benefield's closest friends and relatives have been thrilled to see her business thriving, they think the best part about Benefield's recent journey is seeing her take ownership of her own narrative. She's always been super confident and had this wonderful attitude. I've always looked up to her in that way, but I think TikTok sparked something, uh, Cormany says. It gave her a sense of self-confidence she probably wouldn't have without having somewhere to speak her mind. Of course, speaking freely about a murder case does not come without controversy. I've got a few DMs from people saying I'm psychotic, Benefield said in a recent TikTok video. There's been a few people saying it's concerning that I'm joking about my parents being dead. They're my parents. I can joke how I want to joke. Benefield tells Input that she's even written a stand-up comedy set full of material about Ashley and being orphaned at a young age. Although she hasn't tried it out on a crowd yet. I, write, I wrote a whole set just to see if I can do it, she says. I don't think I'll ever have the confidence to actually perform. I think only three of my friends have actually heard any of my jokes. Yes. Meanwhile, true crime aficionados drawn to Eva's account can occasionally be callous and cruel, offering up comments like, do you feel guilty that maybe Doug wasn't able to tell you if things were bad because he respected you, not wanting to know about the relationship? And I saw a video in which they said her dad was basically doing fraud and was poisoning Ashley. You see, you see, we don't want to do that, you guys. In this community, no, 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 no. Although she understands that inviting such people to speculate on her father's death comes with risks, Benefield is enthusiastic about the attention. I welcome it in a sense. I know why I should be worried because of what Ashley and her team of lawyers put out there. But I know my dad and I know the truth, she says. If the true crime junkies do start digging, they'll see that my dad was a fantastic father, husband and brother, she adds. People will follow the trial and they'll see what actually happened. And I'm sure there's going to be a lot of information in the trial, right? And I really hope it is summer 2023. That's like now, around the corner, right? Um, and she said, okay, I'm just going to, I'm just quickly going to skim through this i don't want to be all day i want to show you something hold on so let's just see ashley benefield's attorney neil g taylor i'll put this all in the description box by the way so you can read the whole thing uh tells input he's watched eva's tiktok videos and found her to be cute still he isn't so thrilled about eva's social media pre presence we are concerned about the impact that her tiktoks may have on the potential jury pool he says via email we invite you to attend the trial and evaluate the evidence as opposed to rumors speculation and or biased representations for yourself to determine the truth or falsity of the allegations so although benefield isn't certain about whether she'll have to testify she knows that she will be at the trial where she'll come face to face with ashley again i don't know what my reaction will be in that moment she says i'm not legally allowed to right now because of this trial but i've always really wanted to talk to her i genuinely want to ask her what did you do that for 
In the meantime, she's got high hopes for a new podcast and fostering a deep connection with the fans that she's picked up across the last year. I want to talk about what's going on in my life and to give my advice on staying positive, she says. She intends to discuss the case in more detail and is open to taking questions from listeners. However, she hopes to focus most of her content on moving forward rather than looking back. I want other people to know that things are going to be okay, even when they seem like they won't be, she says. And that if you maintain a positive attitude and your appreciation for even the littlest things, it can make life a lot more enjoyable. So let me just find that which is... Oh yeah, I must tell, tell you that one. Wait. Oh, maybe it was here. I'll put it in the description box afterwards. Um, her ghost cowboy... So it's at Eva the freaking diva on TikTok and her brand Ghost Cowboy I will also be putting in the description box. So here it is. Yes, yes, I'm in the Netherlands. <laughs> yes, that's where I'm at. Which is Europe. It's not New Zealand. You guys, some of you think I'm in New Zealand. I'm in Europe in the Netherlands, like Holland, right? So you can check it out here. Uh, you can order a t-shirt. She makes really cool t-shirts. Lots of designs. There's an About Us page. Look there. <laughs> Cowboy up and give me a big fat kiss on the lips. Look at the art. It's so cute. So there's that. Now, the one thing that I want to show you quickly um, is... Where's that article that says it? Oh, man. This one. Okay, wait. So one more thing. They say... This is Ashley Benefield. Former Florida ballerina evokes the stand your ground. Oh my word. She evokes stand your ground in 2020 homicide of estranged husband. A former ballerina accused of killing her estranged husband is attempting to have the case dismissed under Florida's stand your ground law, claiming that she fired the gun because she feared for her life. An attorney for Ashley Benefield, 31, filed the motion to dismiss the case. Is she 31 now? We'll have to do some math on that. Anyway, okay, filed the motion to dismiss the case and requested a declaration of immunity. Oh, man, where have we heard that before? Immunity. I just want immunity. Wow. <laughs> Jane says someone needs map time to find out where the Netherlands is. <laughs> yes. So the attorney filed a motion to dismiss the case and requested a declaration of immunity on February 1st, according to court documents. The 105 page document outlines what happened the evening of the shooting from her perspective. And according to the defense, how the couple's tumultuous relationship led to that moment. Ashley Benefield's attorney, Neil Taylor said the motion is in part their effort to shed light on her side of the story. Yes. So she, they say it's pretty horrible. She had a very, very rough go. Taylor said about how the last three years have been for Ashley Benefield as the case has dragged on because of the pandemic and the media attention the case garnered. Yeah. <laughs> Dirty my eyes says immunity, yada, yada, yada. And if you guys are only joining the stream now, I hope that you'll watch the replay and check out because this case, there's a lot to it. And please do... Just please send Eva lots of love. If you're on TikTok, please leave a very kind, loving comments. That'll be very encouraging as well. Um, let's represent the Grizzly True Crime community. And Eva, if you are watching, we are all very proud of you. You're very strong, very resilient. And yeah, we too cannot wait for the trial, right? Oh, yes. Okay. And so this attorney... That's what they're fighting for. And then they say Ashley Benefield was arrested November 4th, a little over a month after the shooting, according to a probable cause affidavit, and was charged with second degree murder with a firearm. She was released on bond and was wearing, she's been wearing an ankle monitor since her release. Oh my word. Previous Sarasota Herald Tribune reporting states that investigators found no evidence that Ashley Benefield was attacked by her husband, Doug Benefield. The complaint in the case states that police found Doug lying in Ashley's bedroom with two gunshot wounds. Previous reporting also cited court records that showed Ashley filed petitions of domestic violence against her husband in 2018 and 2020. Stephanie Murphy, Doug Benefield's former attorney, who is a witness for the prosecution, said that she and Doug Benefield's family always expected her to file the motion, but Murphy is surprised it took so long. This is certainly not the first time that Ashley Benefield has invented an outlandish story and manufactured evidence to try to perpetuate her own false narrative. Okay, so we know what happened with the shooting. Um, 
And so they say stand your ground law is what she's now filing for. What is it and how does it work? Florida's stand your ground law allows a person to use or threaten to use deadly force against another person if they reasonably believe that they need to protect themselves against immediate threat and they don't have a duty to retreat. This means if a person in Florida believes that they're in danger of being seriously hurt or killed and they're not engaging in a criminal activity, they're justified in defending themselves. Unlike traditional self-defense laws, the person doesn't have to try and get away from the attacker first. Now that the defense has invoked the stand your ground, the burden of proving that the shooting was not justified falls onto the prosecution. Taylor said that he expects Circuit Court Judge Stephen White will give the prosecution enough time to read and digest the motion before scheduling a hearing. Assistant State Attorney Suzanne O'Donnell declined to comment as the case is still open and pending, but an assistant from her office said they are waiting for a hearing date to be set. Murphy said that she and the family have confidence in the Assistant State Attorney's ability to prevail against her motion to dismiss and are ready to see the case go to trial. So we don't have a trial date yet. Not yet, but uh, we'll keep an eye on it. We'll keep an eye on, you know, if, if you see anything as well before me, because I cover lots of cases at the same time. So make sure you send it to me if you see something. I'll also be keeping an eye out to see, well, when is the next hearing, um, you know, for like, when is the trial going to happen? Oh, my word, it's been a while, hey? So, okay. I'm not T-Pain, says she's wrong for using DV as an accusation that is harmful to actual victims of DV. I agree. Yes. I just, yeah, I'm sure lots of information will still come out, but to you, even now, the stand your ground one? Oh, no. <laughs> Jenna says, big jump in shirt sales today. <laughs> well, that would be nice, right? Yes, Ghost Cowboy. If you forgot, I'm going to put it in the description box afterwards because remember, I do timestamps for all of you as well. Yes. Yeah, and um, OO says, this goes out the window, surely, as the gunshots were at his back. That's what I'm thinking. He was just getting a box out of her closet and she shot him when he wasn't even facing her. So I don't, I hope that that stand your ground motion she's filed to dismiss the case I hope that that is just not going to work out for her. Yes, that is dismissed. <laughs> Jean Davis says, this one was a doozy. My word. It was, right? It was. Yes. So now you know where I've, I've been <laughs> for the last little bit. I've been deep diving this case. Like, oh my word, like every turn. And you're just like, wait, what? And especially when I heard, okay, so she was accusing him of poisoning her. What? And then you hear about the tea, and then the next minute she's like, she has the baby, and then she's putting her and the baby in a in a in a chamber for for forty hours. What? That is that is a lot. Yes. Allison says ankle monitors don't mean a lot. People here break the law with their monitors. Well, yeah, we just saw a recent case. If you guys didn't see it, I put a video out yesterday on Taylor Shea business. What an absolutely gruesome and crazy case that is. But yeah, she was one of those that had an ankle monitor in Wisconsin and just took it off and then committed the worst crime. You can imagine it's just like, oh man, she's not well, that one. Sure. Okay. So I hope that you enjoyed today's episode. I'm going to do the timestamps for you now, which means I chapter out the video. You'll find those in the pinned comments in the description box, as well as if you hover over the video, you'll see the chapters out. And then I'm going to, as soon as the video is processed, it takes some time to process the live chat uh, replay, but I'll be watching the replay because I'm sure there's lots of comments that I missed. I always like uh, reading what you guys are saying because I can't, you know, look at all of them while I'm presenting things. Um, but I do look at the re the replay again. I look forward to that. Please leave a comment below as well. And if you wouldn't mind, please like the video and share it. Not because you like necessarily the topic. I mean, it's true crime, right? But you like the way that I present true crime and you want to show support for the case as well. So if you want to put it all together, hashtag Ashley Benefield. Make sure you guys spell it right. It's in the title, okay? So it's not confused with anyone else. And then also hashtag Grizzly True Crime would be great as well. And please show Eva lots of love and support. Um, that would be great. Hruit says, Yahoo, one month here, G. Thank you so much for supporting me, Hruit, for a month. So Hruit, are you from South Africa or the Netherlands? Yes. Thank you so much. Uh, Jean says, thank you again, G. You did a great job like always. And thank you so much, uh, moderators. Uh, thank you so much, patrons. I will, for on Patreon, I will put all these documents um, into a case file for you and put it on Patreon if you do want to read it. I downloaded quite a few of them today <laughs> from uh, the court site there. So I'll put it there and it's on Patreon for you as I always do. 
And yeah, thank you so much to everyone who subscribed today. If you haven't yet, please do that. Subscribe, hit the bell, make sure it's on all so that you get all notifications. Otherwise you might miss some and then you're going to get angry with me. Okay. <laughs> but that's up to you. Put, put the bell on. Okay. And if you really want backup, like if you want always notifications, yes, make sure you're on Patreon. And patrons, if you were not part of the YouTube members only stream yesterday, we did quite a deep dive, sort of. It's a... It's not a shadow dive. It wasn't deep. It was like in between, okay, of the case of the, you know, the Portland, Oregon, six bodies being found. Could they be connected? Which the police have put out a statement to say they're not connected. So that like, stop it, everyone. Stop speculating because it's a lot of speculation right now. But we talked about that case as well as 30 children going missing in Ohio in a very small, in like two weeks. So we did look at that um, and I'm going to put that replay on Patreon now as well. So, lots to do, as always. Um, Fury's right here. Thank you so much to everyone who's like, Fury, when he's here, he came to say hi. And I will see you all in the next one. Okay. Stay safe, everyone. Bye.